and it looks like we are live. Thanks for joining us, everyone, for this special retrospective of John Byrne through the 80s. Got my pal Metarog, got Jason from Heroes of Icons with us, and we're going to break it down, and we've got a massive amount of work to get through, <laughs> and we're going to try and squeeze into an hour. Uh, Metarog kind of landed that plane uh, last time when we went over uh, John Byrne in the 70s, but that was only essentially half a decade. So initial thoughts, Roger, before we get rolling here. Yep. And and now he's not only doing the art, he's doing a lot of writing too. So it's du it's right. double double trouble here. Well. Yep. Jason, what are your thoughts before we get rolling through all this stuff? The master has turned into the master in the 80s. <laughs> all right. So he, he's he's gone from being the Padawan Jedi to the master. Oh, yeah, they cut the braid off. Cut the braid off in the eighties. Yep, he 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 definitely. Uh, by the time the eighties started, he was hitting his stride. Um, we talked last time about how he was working through several titles at Marvel on any given month. He, he might have anywhere from two to five titles with his name on it. Um, working. I mean, by the time we get through um, this stack, he will pretty much have touched every major Marvel hero and most of the major DC heroes by the time we're done. So, yeah. But uh, we are going to get started here. Uh, one of the, I'm going to go, I've got my camera two hooked up here. So I'm going to switch over to that real, real quick uh, <laughs> and talk about a couple real special books uh, that I've got in my collection. One is this one, The Art of John Byrne which came out, uh, I believe it was right at 1980. And uh, it is a combination of a, an interview conducted by Terry Austin, of all people. Uh, and they're talking through pretty much everything up through, I get the feeling that was right before they were getting to the Dark Phoenix saga, because John Byrne was talking about what they had coming on X-Men and this big secret event that was going to change everything. Uh, but uh, if anyone has a chance to pick up this book, and if you're a John Byrne fan, it's definitely a must-have. Uh, it's got tons of sketches, uh, whether inked or just you know pencil uh, pencil sketches, things like that. And they it really captures you know his his skill and his imagination. I really love this this figure down here, the spaceman. That otherwise can you remind even... yourself? Oh yeah. I guess that would that would help, wouldn't it? There we go. Yeah, this guy down here. Yeah. I mean, we, it looks like Puck in a, in a you know, a full size yeah, Puck in a uh, yeah. uh, spaceman's outfit. Yeah. But uh, yeah, pencil sketches, you know, hitting all the favorites like the X Men, taking a stab at DC heroes. More. Uh... And then it's got a full story in it, actually, called Critical Error. And that's where we see some of his sci-fi uh, ideas come to light. So it's got the complete mm -hmm. story in here. Wow. But, uh, nice. So I've got that. And then the other thing I wanted to hit on real quick was this. And, and Roger, I sent you a copy of this, and you might know a little bit more about the actual history of this book than I do. I kind of, I just knew it was a thing. Uh, I mm -hmm. bought it when it came out, and other than that, I don't know much other than I don't think John Byrne was very happy that it was published. That's that's what I heard. Yeah, that's what I heard, that it, it wasn't, he wasn't happy about it. Um, but I don't know that much about it either, except when you sent, when you sent it to me, I looked it up, and um, and it seemed like there was another project in the works, and this sort of came out of what he had left, I guess, for the publisher. Um, but there's some there's some beautiful technique. Um, uh, you know, you can tell you know how how Burns, uh, the way he works his art. You two are artists, so you would know this about better. But how he how he goes about it, how he visualizes, and how he um, fills in. I mean, it's, it's, it's really interesting to see the progression of his work. That's what I thought was most impressed about it. 
Yeah, I, I love seeing everything from, you know, this kind of more finished rendering of the blob to this really loose sketch of the Hulk. Um, yeah, as, as an artist, I love to see process work. And I, I always thought this kind of stuff was fascinating. Um, Definitely. Yeah. So, yeah, the back of it advertises the John Byrne sketchbook, which I don't ever think saw publication unless it became the art of John Byrne that I just showed you, but I'm not, I'm not sure about that. But those mm, were from two, two different publishers. Yeah, that's a good question. But, but you know, but those publishers, they, they changed names like, you know, like, like divorcees. So you never know. Right. <laughs> All right. Before we get rolling much further, let's check in with uh, the members of the chat. Uh, we've got uh, Magic Lasso. You can see it, Ryan. You were here early. Comic Head 84 is here. Hood Rat Comics is here. Good to see you, Hood Rat. And my pal, Coach Vic, you know, he's keeping it. Holding down that wrench in the live stream or in the live chat. <laughs> so let's dig into the the what I would consider the best of the best comic book wise ever. And that would be the beginning of the Dark Phoenix saga in the X-Men. So of course you've got the 129 with the first appearance of of Kitty and Emma Frost. We've got the 130 appearance with Dazzler. Very jealous. <laughs> you don't have that? Although Burn No, although Burn, you know, Burn did not like Dazzler being pushed on him. He he didn't he didn't like that aspect, but but he did a beautiful Dazzler, a gorgeous Dazzler. Of course leading up to the like the, the ending of the Dark Phoenix saga, we've got this whole Hellfire Club um, storyline that kind of feeds into it, kind of stokes the flames of the Dark Phoenix, so to speak. All that cover featuring Wolverine. Yeah. That book was meant. Slashy, slashy, slashy. I've heard he just does away with like dozens there. I got that one. I hear tales of, of uh, Chris Claremont's interest in uh, this kind of uh, evening attire. Uh, I don't get into that. But a, that's that's really my speculation. <laughs> Lingerie. Yeah. Uh, nice. So I love that logo interaction there. Love it. For sure. One of the most iconic covers of the run, in my opinion. Definitely. Agreed. But... It, this is a book that I talk about a lot, so I'm not going to talk about it a lot on this live stream, but in a few weeks, I'll be on John's Comics with Kids and um, uh, remind me of the other dude that does the X-Men show on Tuesday nights. They do, they, they is it no good? Comics. No good comics. Yeah, there you go. So I'll be on their episode no talking about X-Men 136, which was my introduction to the X-Men. Mm, good good introduction <laughs> and, and of course my my reading order for for the x Men was 136 and then 138 you didn't want you didn't want to see the death i i did but it was my white whale for years i had to hunt it down this was the the issue i found for a quarter at a garage sale wow oh, so this, this is the, the well-loved and look at look at yeah, Jason with doubles down there. You show off. There's there's no eBay. There was no comic shops. It was <laughs> if you go on vacation and happen to be in a town with a comic shop, you might stop in. Um, yep. You might run into a used bookstore every now and then, or you hit the mother, mother load like I did at a, oh. a garage <laughs> sale where I bought the majority of the John Byrne run of X Men. But later oh, on man. in my like, what a dream. Career, wow. I, I bought a nicer copy of 137, and yes, I've yeah. walked around from show to show. Cool. So we've got Chris Claremont down there, down here. Chris Claremont, and then John Byrne next to him, and then Jim Shooter, and Terry Austin too. They hit and sign that at a nice. Motor City Comic Con. Wow. I Man. So yeah, definitely one of my wow. most prized possessions. It's oh, I can imagine. 
it's a nicer copy, but not, you know, not a contender, as they say. Ooh, I got to show you this one, Speaking of signed comics and the Dark Phoenix saga, do we all know about this? Oh, yeah. I got, got it. So I had that's Chris that's Claremont. how Byrne wanted to end it, I think. Yeah. Right. So I had Chris Claremont sign it up here and I had John Byrne. I took it to a John Byrne signing. Hand it to him in my stack of books. And he looks at it and goes, oh, a reprint. And he had this lectern with a lid that he lifted the lid, pulled out a rubber stamp. <laughs> and... <laughs> He rubber stamps his autograph. Wow. <laughs> a Look at that. Of a, reprint, or a reprint for a reprint, so to speak. So wow. Wow. I mean they they That's say a don't your heroes. Yeah. You know, so John Burns obviously got a an, an ego, you know, on part with Neil Adams. Yeah. Some people always have, have their ego because they kind of deserve it. But uh yeah, I'll, at least I've yeah. got that story. Anyway, onward. We've got 139, which I have the 138. <laughs> oh. 138 got thrown to the side. I, oh, I, that's right. You I, did I, show. You skipped the 137. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I did show the 138. That's right. I forgot. Hey, I, I forgot. You skipped the 137. I get it. I get it. So, and I'm, I'm going to set this aside. This is this is the copy I bought back in the day. And the other, the 136 I showed was the one I bought back in the day. So I want to bring that back up here in a second. So there we've got the second uh, episode of the Wendigo storyline. Beautiful brought, book. Uh, uh, yeah. The Guardian back down, back in the picture. Then, of course, Days of Future Past. Yes. Amazing, the, amazing story. Amazing, so amazing people, story. You know, as much as I love the Dark Phoenix saga, this stands up as many people's favorites, and I don't blame them at all. Just yeah. two issues. Yeah. <laughs> Just two issues. Yeah. Part two. But the complexity of the story uh, and how well it was rendered, you know, and all the little details that they went into it was just, man, it was, it's such an easy read. It's just like before you blink, it's over, you know? Yep. Yeah. And then, of course, we've got the end of the John Byrne era on X Men in 143, which, yeah. as far as my taste, really in comics, cool got one shot. Man. Yeah. Got that yeah. date stamp for you, Metarog. Oh, you know, I love those. You know it. <laughs> you know, I love that. I, lo I love it because it tells you, hey, I was there. Somebody was there at that point. I was actually there. I picked that up off the. Rack, so love it, love it. Cool. So there, there are some some runs I think that kind of go overlooked or unheralded, and I think it, John Burns' run on Captain America qualifies for one of those runs that people just don't talk about very often. Hundred percent. So yeah, he, I don't think I any of those. So he he's. <gasps> relatively short run of six or eight issues and uh he started with 147 148 is probably my favorite cover of the run yeah the dragon right. man dragon man he can shield like a cookie <laughs> yeah Look at I that. Put this in, in, in every hot box I, I put together for common glories just so i can have like food comes up as a common glory. <laughs> i want to have that one handy <laughs> That one's the uh, 149. And we're fighting the robots of the other superheroes. Yeah. Then Actually, course, the machine smith. Mm. Then every election day, you know, this is this is who I would vote for. <laughs> 100%, man. 100%. No shenanigans so, there, man. He's the people's choice. Man, I should have set up my light better. I'm getting a lot of glare. I think that's Mr. Hyde, if I recall correctly. Yep. And then 
Mr. Hyde's back for the, the next part with Batrock the Leaper. Mm, part two. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hyde wasn't enough. He had to come up with Batrock too, you know. This is a good throwback. This, this is probably my favorite story in that whole arc. Yep. It's a good throwback to the yeah. invaders because uh, they introduce or reintroduce barren blood. Yep. I will yeah. suck your blood. Even got <laughs> um, you and Jack making an appearance in the background there. Yeah. Yeah. If you're an invaders fan, pick up these, at least these two issues, man. And it also tells you how, how deadly a weapon that shield is if he wanted it to be. Indeed. <laughs> Comic Cat 84 says, Wow, didn't know Burn had a cap run. Hey, man. Been here for the long haul. What? Penny. <laughs> you gotta this is this is a Miller cover, but a burn. It's like a, a re he reimagined cap number one here. Yep. Uh, with the old shield, the whole bit. Oh, that's so good. This, you're right. You're right, Jay Hood. This is so underrated. When when I when I read these, I was like, oh man, I fell in love with this run so 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 hard. I fell hard, guys. So one of one of the things I thought was interesting about the Captain America run is something I, I had learned from a uh, an interview with Joe Rubenstein, who was the inker on it, and that was that uh, John Bird didn't like his inking job on it because. Rubenstein took a tack that it was more of a throwback to Neil Adams' work. That it looks looked too much like Neil Adams, and that's what uh, what Rubenstein had, had intended. But mm -hmm. one of the reasons I wanted to hold back this issue one thirty eight of the X Men is that if if anyone you know knows the X Men and you've read through the, the Burn era, this is like the the retelling of the entire history of the X Men. You know. Back to day one. Love the ads. But I thought it was interesting that they would do that, you know, in the X-Men. And then in when John Byrne goes to do Captain America, the last issue he did in that run is a retelling of Captain America's <laughs> origin from day one. Yeah. Yeah. Blow that up. Yeah. Now let's let's see that let's see that up yeah yeah there you go and yeah. again I mean besides just the mastery of the figure work you get the backgrounds you know you yes get every square inch of the page is full of art or di and or dialogue. But I, I'm historically I've not been a huge Captain America reader, but this is by far my favorite run on Captain America, you know, pretty much period. Yeah, he, he got the uh, the old um, headgear perfectly, you know, where he had the more of a half mask. Uh, right, perfect. And did, didn't cover his neck as you know. Didn't cover his neck, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I definitely oh. got to put those up. Oh, yeah. Giant oh, yeah. size X-Men. $60, people. Oh, <laughs> man. Listen, if I look at those ads, I'll go insane, okay? Yeah, I, I love this one. He meets oh, FDR. Yeah. Classic scene. Cut the new suit. He gets the news. He gets the shield, and I think he meets Bucky there. And oh, look at that spread right there, man! Yeah, you love it. Look at that, man! Come on, come on! So yeah, we could look at that all night. <laughs> yeah, let's. Yeah. <laughs> all right, let's see. Let me get that. Oh. Camera switch back so you can see my ugly mug. And and that was that's while while he was still on the X Men, that was going on. So right again, he's doing double duty there. I've got one more book to slip in here before we get, get to the Fantastic Four. 
And I don't know if anyone realizes this. I might even, I'm going to put this on camera too. If anybody even realizes this, that way back before the Man of Steel, John Byrne worked on a DC project. And it was a Batman project. This is the Untold Legend of the Batman, which was a three-issue retelling of Batman's story, his origin, wrapped around a mystery. Right. And John Byrne drew this, and Jim Aparo inked it. Oh, let's go big again. It's a beautiful issue. Beautiful. And it, it kind of goes back, and, and of course, this is pre-crisis, but it kind of ties... Bruce Wayne's father a little bit more closely into the Batman mythos, in my opinion. Right. Right. Of course, you get the crime alley scene. Notice no no pearl necklace. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, man. It's John Byrne inked by Jim Aparo on Batman, and nobody ever mentioned Great it. team. Yeah, great team there. Great team. Look at that. Yeah, that Robin is. Yeah, that that three issue mini is a is a pretty good read if you're a Batman fan. It really is. For sure. All right, Roger, you're gonna take the lead here on the Fantastic Four. Portion. Okay. All right. Well, so we we've been talking about Burn. Now he did help with the plots in um, X Men here and there. And uh, certainly in that Captain America run, you know, you can you can tell that he he was a good storyteller. There was no doubt about that. Um, and then Fantastic Four in, in in the early '80s and late '70s, kind of floundering, didn't have a really good direction. I I want to say Defalco was the writer on, on most of those issues. He's a competent writer, but. You know the the villains were not that villainous, and there was a lot of silliness with the with the actual four characters of, of Fantastic Four, and the art was pretty good. You had you had Perez for part of it, um, but the, then he got the call, you know, because the, that because of what he had he had already done with X Men and Captain America to, to from Shooter to take over here, and uh, I think he only. Got Got it with the proviso that he 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 was like the main guy. Like we said, he had a pretty good ego, mm -hmm. and at this point, he was like, "I want, I have a vision for the Fantastic Four, and it's going to be mine, pretty pretty much my vision that I want to move forward." So he both wrote, plotted, and penciled uh, this run for, I think it was over five years. I'm not going to show all five years of it, but. I'll show you some of the highlights, right? He, he started in 232. Uh, he did do the a lot of the covers here. Yeah, it's it's a it's a huge amount of, of of Fantastic Four, but let me tell you, next to the next to the X-Men run, this is his opus here because again, it's it's his clear vision here. And then of course we're going to talk about Man of Steel in a bit. And what he did to the Fantastic Four is that he really, he really made them even more three-dimensional. Um, he accentuated a lot of the uh, of Sue Richards really came out of her shell at this point. From Invisible Girl, she became Invisible Woman. She was much more assertive, much, much more powerful uh, with her her constructs and and um, and how long she could she could hold her invisibility and how she can project her her fields, et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, and Johnny started a lot of uh, different relationships, uh, and he became a little more mature uh, in this in this run. Um, here they take on ego, okay? So you know, not exactly a, a pushover there, a whole planet. And uh, that's another thing that the scope started ratcheting it up. You know, that was they they went for more. Uh, for, although they'd had a lot of space adventures here, they had a lot of. More a lot of powerful foes come up. Uh, this is a great cover right here yeah. by Byrne uh, with 
so many of the Marvel heroes. And this is the 20th anniversary of the Fantastic Four. Yeah, we all got it. Yeah, triplets, baby. <laughs> Look at that yeah. yeah. Okay, wait. The, the 20th uh, anniversary. The 20th anniversary of the Fantastic Four. I've, yes. I've been collecting comics for a long time. Yep. 1961 to 1981, right there. Um, and okay, this this here, this is one of those things where <laughs> again he's showing his whimsical side, right? Uh, <laughs> which which is going to be coming up with the She Hulk, which I don't know if we're going to be talking about it this time or when Jason gets it. But over here we have John Byrne, and that's another thing he liked to he liked to be in the story. Mm -hmm. Uh, he liked to put his likeness in the story a lot, and usually pretty effectively. Um, here's here's the um, Frankie Ray cover, where she first uh, realizes that she is a very powerful torch. Like, of course, she was dating Johnny Storm at this point. Um, here we have the uh, the beautiful cover with Atelier in there. And Black Bolt, when they he moved the whole humans to the moon, okay. Yeah. Again, we're talking about rat, but ratcheting up here the the storylines uh, from the Fantastic Four. They're getting just bigger and they're getting deeper. Um, that's, yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to talk too much, or else we'll be here forever. Uh, here's where uh, Galactus storyline starts with Terax. Uh, the one of his uh, heralds, real creep here, uh, <laughs> just doesn't care who gets killed or who gets maimed, or, um, you know. But the Fantastic Four take him down. But here, this is a really interesting story, where Galactus is starting. He he hasn't fed in a while, so he's very weakened, and they actually, he actually defeat him. Like he like collapses and he's dying. And that's important because uh, Reed Richards actually saves him. He comes up with a contraption there that mimics the energies of the of the planet and saves him. And uh, because Terex is now Computo, uh, he takes Frankie Ray as his herald, uh, Nova. Okay. But remember that storyline because it's going to come up a little later. Uh, here again, we got the uh, focus on on uh, Sue Richards. Of course, we have to have some Doctor Doom in there, the, the villain that never goes away, or the anti-villain, I guess, that never goes away for the Fantastic Four. He's got he's got Reed Richards, so jealous of Reed Richards uh, that uh, it consumes him essentially. Uh, and then here we have again the uh, the Inhuman storylines up there in the in the moon. And this is an interesting issue where uh, the it, it says X Factor there, but actually it's not. It's there's no X Factor at this point yet, you know. Um, but actually the Shi'ar, the, the gladiator guy is like just he's he's Superman. after Reed Richards here, right? And 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 just he lifts up this building and Richards surmises, hey, he can't do that, it would crumble. So it he knows his powers were psionic, and he figured that out, and he used that to put the kibosh on him. Again, you know, that's that's the kind of stuff Burn thinks. You know, he was like, hey, yeah, normally you can't hold a building up like that, you know? So, so and you see here, the if you compare this to our the thumbnail, so you've got another thumbnail of Superman in the position of, of the... Uh, yeah. Guardian, <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, that's the homage there, huh? Yeah, the gladiator. In, in place of the yeah. gladiator. Yeah, there's the gladiator. That's the homage to that um, Superman with the Legion of Superheroes issue. Yep. yep. So yeah, really good stuff. Great action. Compelling writing. Uh, here they go into the negative zone. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop when I get to the trial of Reed Richards because I keep going on and on here. Right? Uh, this is an all, all landscape issue. By the way, uh, again, oh, really? a very, very you know innovative kind of thing. 
right? So my, 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 I got to come clean here. I, I've collected a lot of the Fantastic Four one and not read it. So I had no mm -hmm. idea that the whole issue was sideways. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, you got to open up those comics, my, my brother. Yep. <laughs> it's, it's cool. It's cool. It's cool. So more burn goodness here. Here's a couple like kind of one-off villains here. He's taking a break there. But, and here we got to start the storyline of Negative Zone with Annihilus. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, good stuff. More more Galactus here with the Nova. And I wonder who, whose paw that could be. Dr. Doom, of course. And of course he says, I love when he says this, three against Doomsday. Because at this, and here we got Terax back. This creep is back. Yep. And then supposedly this is where Terax kills Dr. Doom. But no, you, there's no way you're killing Dr. Doom. There's no way. Yeah. And then lastly, I'll end with this, man. And that's the uh, great story arc. At, at that point, Reed Richards is whisked away, and um, and they're not sure what happened. So they use the watcher here, you know, and they sort of wink, wink, you know, find out that he has been taken by the Shi'ar because he's on trial for saving Galactus, and because the repercussions of that are other worlds dying, uh, they're they're essentially, you know, putting him on trial for murder uh, or, or genocide, you know. So, and, and again, he, uh, Burn actually appears in there. Uh, Burn is actually taken up to to the Shi'ar uh, trial planet or moon or whatever, and he actually narrates part of the story. Really cool stuff. So that's it. I'll end it there because um, I could keep going. The note in the quarter box that this was the assistant editor's month, which I never realized that. Well, I, it's not that I didn't realize, but I wouldn't have guessed that they'd do an important issue like that. <laughs> yep. But yeah, man, that's you get to the trial of Reed Richards, and you're only about halfway through the run. So that just shows you how long running and deep that series is. Yeah, and it's all good. There's there's not a dog in the bunch, honestly. I think the, the one thing, yeah, we 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 don't don't feel like we have to go through the whole run. But the other thing I, I think it's important to note is that as a result of the Secret War, the thing is separated from the group, and they get a new member. As their powerhouse. That's right. That's right. So. And that's going to be important later on uh, when Bird takes over. Yeah. The uh, She Hold title. Yeah. Yes. Spoiler, she's not on the not on the cover for uh, four issues. No. So. And this is where Ben stays over on War World, but we don't we figured out we don't have those comics. I have them somewhere. I can't find them. Yeah, I had issue one, and, and the th they started the theme series when they ended Marvel Two and One. So yeah, the last issue of Marvel Two and One came out one month, and then thing number one came out the next thing month. Yeah. yeah, but the Burn did also. I think he did the writing on that one as well. Yeah. Oh yeah, great homage there to Action One there. Yeah, love it, love it. So Jason, do you want to pick up the the the, uh, the next opus that Burn began at Marvel? And where is that? <laughs> exactly. Right behind you on the shelf. Ah, uh, the Canadian team that Jay Hood spoke about uh, a little bit last time with the end of the 70s. And uh, this here was when I actually started getting money to buy comic books. 
<laughs> and uh, I liked Alpha Flight better than the Avengers. And to me, they were like right beneath X Men. Yeah. And uh, do any of you guys have this whole run? I do. I know you have a Metarog, don't you? I don't have the whole run, but uh, I'm with you 100%, man. It's it's so underrated. Um, some really good storylines, great art, um, and, and it's cheap, you know? It goes for cheap, which is, to me is amazing. Yeah, totally different type of characters. Yep. Um, and just some of the ways he, just black and white. Look at that. You Look at that cover, cover man. It's, wow. it's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, his aurora was gorgeous. You know, just gorgeous. One hundred percent. I love John. I love, can draw the, the, I love the character design of Puck. I don't know why he appealed to me so well. Uh, you talked him up, Jay Hood. Yep. <laughs> there he is. He's such yeah. a cool character. Yeah, he's actually actually a tall man. Who was shrunk because he's holding in that demon? He was cursed, right? Good stuff. Cursed, yeah. And uh, Snowbird, Snowbird who's uh, a really cool character. Uh, her powers are mystical and based off of yep. all of the uh, Canadian mythical monsters. She's a metamorph that can transform into all of the different right. monsters, including a Sasquatch. Right. I, I, I think it's, awesome. it's interesting how Canadian John Byrne made his Canadian superhero. <laughs> yeah. He, he really <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. stuck to yeah. stories that he, we here in America wouldn't otherwise have known about. Yeah. And Aurora was really That's cool right. just because she had a right. split personality. Really, really yeah. cool with that. Yep. Very gentle, or you don't want to mess with her at all. Yeah. Yeah. These books were great. And the uh, oh, relationship great. between North Star and Aurora, you get, a, um, I don't know who anybody who watched Game of Thrones, but you get a, a lot of that weird vibe between them. Yeah. Before uh, North Star's true nature is uh, shown later on. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some that wasn't burned, did that one. <laughs> No, come on, man, the rock. We know that wasn't him. <laughs> that wasn't Burn, man. Come on. That, that he, he did not have that in mind at all. And one of my one of my favorite covers here. Yeah. Um, just the detail. Yeah, that's that's me in the morning, right there, man. That is. That's that's me right there. Call? Yeah. That's the, a beast. The color and everything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah beautiful. I could never imagine the that. The mustache goes brown. Everything. Man. And here we go. Guardian. Yeah. And this this here made me think about comic books very seriously because, you know, what what leader would just run into a trap by himself? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And 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 Byrne loves these silhouettes. This whole vignette that he does here. Beautiful. And, yeah. you know, one, one yeah. of the things you, you don't know until you read the stories is that, you know, Alpha, you've got Alpha Flight, then you've got Beta Flight, and was it Omega Gamma Flight. Flight, and Delta and Gamma Flight? Gamma Flight. Like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Delta Flight? <laughs> they don't, I don't think they have Delta. I think they skipped a Gamma. Yeah. It's been a while. Yeah. yeah. This, right here, this, is, uh, this is one of my personal grails. Mm -hmm. I think I have like five of these. To my shame, nice. but um, <laughs> just so got to show something from the inside. We we won't spoil it, but something big happens in this issue. Very so big. Yes. Haven't haven't read it. It kind of all leads to this. No spoilers, but just <laughs> a beautiful Man. book, beautifully yeah. rendered. For sure, just the flow. Yeah, man, that's that's crispy stuff right there. Like that said, this this whole series, like I, I just picked up another copy, a better copy than I had of this issue twelve, just like a week ago. 
for two dollars. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. They're cheap. They're cheap. Cheap, cheap, cheap. Cheap. Perfect. Cheap. I I don't know if it's because we're here in a in the United States and that's a Canadian team or whatever. I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but let me tell you, anytime I see them, I pick them up because why not? Yeah. They're beautiful oh, comics. Must have in the collection. Must have, yeah. Wolvie, yep. Heather oh, Hudson. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. We're going to run through these quick. And she was such an awesome character, Morena, but yep. tragic. tragic. Very tragic, yeah. Yeah. Little so master. Good. Burns run on Alpha Flight goes through issue 29. Yep. Do I have right, oh, here we go? <laughs> nice. Oh, oh, rip that it is beautiful. That is gorgeous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Isn't that like the opposite of X-Men 109? What is it? Where it's almost the same rip. Yep. It's, it's the almost same. the same rip. Yep. Yep. Yeah. 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 And when you put them side by side, you can see how he grew. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. The wife taking up the mantle. That hairline he got, though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm <gonna> leave <laughs> Here we go. The talisman. Yeah, oh, yeah. The daughter of the shaman. For oh, all, my, yeah. all my speculators out there, key. Key. Good character. Really good character. Yeah. And I loved how he did stuff like this. Like <laughs> wicked. Yeah. With the old metal face. Yeah. Until you see what's underneath. Yeah. If that yeah, doesn't make you want to buy it, I don't know what will. Won't. <laughs> yeah, that's the truth. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, for all the chubby chases out there. Yeah. Pink Pearl. Pink Pearl. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah Burn didn't just that. draw one bigger woman, man. He drew, he drew all types of women. Look look at his yeah. West Coast Avengers when he draws a big Bertha, you know? I mean, you know, he's everywhere. He can do it all. The Sox, Sasquatch yeah, versus yeah. Sasquatch. And uh, this it's 24 was an oversized issue. This was pretty dope. Where did they go in this? It was like some mystical realm of tundra, some such, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. it has been years since I read it. Yeah, yeah, it was mystical realm where where Puck or so, is it, is that where Puck to be, reverts to normal or something? I forgot. Yeah, there's that, a, there's some where he reverts to normal. He, he grows to regular size. Hey, Seawood, good to see you. Here we go with the silhouette again. Yep. So this time it's, it's the same from, cover, man. It's that same cover you showed. Ooh. Sorry, wrong button. You bumped them out. <laughs> yeah. Lovely. Are we doing that bad? <laughs> Rookie mistake. Yeah, I buried my copy. There you go. There you go. It's the same cover, man. Just that reverse. I wonder, I wonder who the, the silhouette could be. Yeah, <laughs> shine a light through it, man. You can, you can tell who that is. <laughs> We're down oh, yeah. to the wire. That's, yeah, I think that's this that's beta like, flight in there. I think. Yeah, with Wild Child. Wild Child and um, Di Diamond. What's her name? Di Diamond Lil. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I love these comics, man. I, I'm gonna have to reread these now, Jason. After you got me, you got me all amped up now. I know, right? It's been so yeah. long. I love, I love these comics. I just, I don't care if they're worthless. They're beautiful comics. There was something. I don't know. You know what I'm talking about? It's a gatefold. Uh, oh yeah. Picture. Yeah, I'm fuzzy on this one. Yeah, I, th I think what I know what he's talking know? about. I think I know what he's talking about. I don't have that one. That one you're talking about, though. Yeah, was that twelve? 
I might have been 12, yeah. I don't think I have that one. All right, we ain't going to keep the people. Only got two issues yeah. left. That's 27. Oh, but, but it's not the Guardian after all. <laughs> <laughs> And the last one is a Secret Wars 2 crossover. Yeah. Yeah. And that's when the Hulk John gets Burke. in there and, and, and Hulk so, just and just annihilates the team. <laughs> <laughs> just, just he tears guys apart in there. Oh man. Beautiful books. Great. Great. So stuff. I, thought, Great I thought it was a, a unique idea for with Marvel at the time to basically just take a creative team that's working on one book and decide we're just going to switch you. So the guys that were working on the Incredible Hulk at the time became the artist and writer team on Alpha Flight and John Byrne took over Incredible Hulk. And if, if you're a Hulk fan, <laughs> I'm going to camera two again. I mean, who doesn't like the Hulk, but Hulk smash. Beauties. And I see a little bit more freshness in this work. Make yourself big, Jay Hood. Make yourself the, big, man. We can't see that. Yeah. The old Versus, eyes, we can't see that small. <laughs> yeah, you know, comparing this to the work he was doing on Alpha Flight, you could tell that he got a little bit more juice out of it. That, uh, you know, definitely. Art, artists do yeah. get tired of working on certain things, and I, I can see, you know, just switching. From one title to another, you know, gives you a little bit more creative uh, energy. So I definitely yeah, did, agree. do see that in, in this. I think yeah, his Doc puts, Samson was a monster. Yeah. He puts a little bit more effort into the background. Yeah. He, he was slacking on backgrounds for a while. Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> yeah. That Doc yeah. Samson is beast. Yeah. Flashback of the Hulk super super like defined, yeah. This face on the Hulk, I loved that face. I, I'm positive I redrew that somewhere, like bigger. <laughs> I mean, I drew my own. Face. Wow, that's look look at the size difference between the Hulk and Doc Samson. That's one thing he he was really good at. You know, when when characters were supposed to have different weights and so forth, he was spot on with the size differences. Man, look at that. The right. Doc Samson is a huge guy. He looks like. A 98 pound weakling compared to Hulk. Yeah. Spider Man and his amazing friends following the Smurfs. <laughs> Never missed that Saturday mornings. But man, I mean, we don't get these kind of action pages in comics anymore. No, we I don't. Mean, just seven panels of just back and forth. And then we get. Here comes the juggernaut, and Hulk Hogan has his own Saturday morning <laughs> look, look, look at what he does to the juggernaut, man. These these are all like not all villains, you know, but right. Look at that panel layout with the like kind of like a right there, kind of like a shard. Right. Yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah. Modok. That's because his mind is broken. When Modoc yeah. was a, a real villain. Not like today. <laughs> Comic relief. Abomination. And then look at that right there. Holy smokes, man. Look at the oh. muscles back. I know, right? Oh man. I gotta hit the gym, man. Oh yeah. <laughs> look at that, man. Look at that recoil, <laughs> man. Oof. He's, he's breathing through his mouth there, man, because his nose broken. Let's see. So we get a relatively short run on the Hulk. We only get yeah. yeah, I think I think it was six issues. issues. Yeah. Um, look at that. Torn in half. Like you said, Jason, like his, like, his identity crisis, where they split into two different characters. This battle with the West Coast Avengers for an issue. West and East Coast Avengers, I think. 
they had to, they had, to, they had to bring in the both coast for that for that for the whole the bi coastal Avengers. Yeah, bi coastal. That's right. That's right. Hulk no more. No, nice. no smoking Hulk. And then oh, two copies. The, the big wedding and issue. The wedding. Remembers the wedding issue, right? Yeah. Something must have happened at the wedding. Yeah. As they do. <laughs> and this wasn't a Batman redo there. Do you guys have this one? Yes. Mine is away. Yeah, I got it. I didn't I didn't bring it out. Yeah, good, good stuff. Yeah. Marvel Fanfare number 29. So this is a all splash page story. Yeah. So yeah. every every page is one image drawn by John Byrne featuring the Hulk. And I, I for some reason I thought this came out quite a while after his Hulk run, but it looks like it was about the same time. And I, I'm not sure yeah, exactly what the same. publishing strategy was behind Marvel Fanfare, whether these were stories that were kind of drawn and finished on spec, so if they had a fill-in issue, and then they needed yeah. a place to publish it later. I think that's yeah. Kind of Shooter had like um, a policy where he had he wanted to have fill-in issues in the back because of the dreaded deadline doom in the '70s. So there was a lot of inventory stories, so much so that they started Marvel Fanfare so that they could, and Perez had some in there. They had some really good stories in there, but they were all, you know, on the back burner kind of stories. And then right. they had so many that they had to say, why not publish them? And that's what they did there. Perez did that Black Will story. I I'm keep like racking my brain. Where would they have published that otherwise? I mean, Probably yeah, a, as a backup right. feature somewhere, like an Avengers or who knows where, you know. I mean, or maybe it was a pet project, you know. He just wanted something to have so that they could throw it. Even if it was in a, a non, if it, it didn't fit the title, at least it was a new story. Right. So the one title I neglected to grab was West Coast Avengers. Did either of you pick that up? Hold yeah, that up. I got you covered, buddy. All right. Got your cover right here. Um, this was to right, I think, right after the Hulk. He came. He came on this, um, and he again. West Coast Avengers was. It was a title which was kind of floundering, and he came in and he really changed the dynamic. Um, he made um, Scarlet Witch a lot more formidable, right, and a lot more assertive, and then later on. Made her downright evil. Yeah. Um, and he also changed the vision. Uh, this is the vision here, believe it or not. Naked. Um, he made him more robotic, more uh, less emotional. And this is that white vision issue mm -hmm. that I was hot for like a, a minute and a half or something. For like a thousand dollars one day. Yeah, right. <laughs> no. No. And this is what I was telling you about. He he loves these quirky teams, you know, the the Great Lakes Avengers. So you had the mm -hmm. West Coast, East Coast. Now you got Middle of the Country Avengers, and you got like again Big Bertha here, which I told you is <laughs> cool. Um, you got, got this guy here, Immortal Man, who essentially couldn't be killed. You know, um, I think this was Flat Man. He looks pretty flat. flat. It was Flat Man. Yeah, yeah. So it was, a, it was a it was one of those goofy teams that he liked to do here and again. And again, here I'm gonna go real quick because we're 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 getting close to the hour already. Yep. Um, but he this this is where he started making the the Black Widow, I mean, the Scarlet Witch, really powerful. I mean, and she she had like this mental break. Um, look look at look at look at the face there. Like she kind of like Joker like like just. You know, just lunatic, lunatic, lunatic like. like. He also reintroduced the uh, Golden Age Torch, which is actually, I believe, Toro. And here's that story where Master Pandemonium was actually the his Star Scarlet Witch's kids were actually part of him of his demonic appendages or something. I don't know. That was kind of a weird kind of story. 
Um, Brett brought back Hank Pym. There's the UFOs. Of course, he always homages Fantastic Four number one. He did that in FF, right? There you go. Beautiful cover here. With Thor. And there is the new costume for Scarlet Witch, where she starts to become a little bit more uh, villainous. And if you have any any uh, questions about whether that is, look who she's hanging out with over here. None other than Magnus himself. Yeah. So, yeah, a good little run. I wouldn't put it anywhere near um, his Fantastic Four or X-Men or Alpha Flight run, but much better than the West Coast Avengers around it, that's for sure. Right. Yep. I mean, that, that was kind of the thing. He was money in the bank as far as quality material and definitely as far as the company goes, sales. And it was a big, giant deal when the announcement came that he was going to jump over to the competition and do Superman. And look, this is, what, 1986, 87? 86, yeah. Look, I, I, I want, I want Chase in the yeah, variant. This is, yeah, this is the first, the first actual variant cover, right? Is yeah, this yes. one? In, I forgot to pull out the other one, but yeah, yeah, totally, totally reimagined Superman here. Totally reimagined them. They, they, they've even got the gimmick. It's hard to see, but the, the ink is uh, metallic, so it's got a little bit of a sheen to it. Yeah, and that was, of course, the first time that something yeah. like that had been done as well. So, and it th th this happened post crisis. So that the idea that Marv Wolfman had, and Dick Giordano as the editor in chief was totally on board with, was that with Crisis on Infinite Earths, they were going to kind of tidy up the entire DC universe amalgamate a bunch of the little tendrils of storyline that had been told with all these different retellings of origins and different ages trying to explain how superman and batman were in world war ii and were still alive and kicking and doing well in the 80s and what they wanted to do was redo the entire history the problem was that they couldn't get all the other artists or all the other writers and editors on board with this kind of as a as a real clean cut because the books kept going after crisis and everything that you read in a monthly title seemed like it was relatively unchanged until you started getting books like Man of Steel and Batman Year One and George Perez picking up the new a Wonder Woman series where no. they started kind of separating it and retelling the origins and they were saying these are the new this is the new canon this is what we're doing going forward right. so john Byrne reset a lot of the rules with his work on man of steel um took him back to his roots as a daily planet reporter um re-established you know the supporting cast of lois lane perry white jimmy olsen um, Lex Luthor would be the big bad guy. Um, kind of one of the more pointed changes was that Batman and Superman didn't quite get along. They were a little bit suspicious of each other. <laughs> very and, different, uh, very different ideas about what justice and crime fighting should be. Yes, right. I mean, we 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 all grown up on Super Friends. And buying world's world's finest comics and stuff like that, where every month these guys were teaming up, and then suddenly they were at odds with one another. Yeah. And this is the way it should be. There, there's no way those two could be compatible. There's just no way. They have, there's no way that they, they have totally different mindsets about um, society and their roles in it. So they should never really be buddy buddies. No. So Lex Luthor was less of a kind of scientific madman genius and more of a politician, big big businessman. Um, yep. Was 
doing a lot more, pulling a lot more weight with his money rather than his mind to a certain ex extent. Yep. Oh, exactly. Of course, he, he, he was an, an industrialist and and uh, a mover and a shaker, a manipulator of the system. Yep, all that. And and we should also mention Jay Huda that in this iteration, there was no he did not have a career as Superboy. He right. went right to Superman. Yeah. To Superman. Yeah. Which kind of emu emulates what they did in the movie to a certain extent. Um, they rewrote the fact that his parents were still alive, which hadn't been the way it was before. A lot of Superman purists had problems with that. Uh, re, re kind of orienting the whole Kryptonian background, uh, things like that. So I, I don't want to like undercut or undervalue how significant this was. But the, the fact is, we're coming up, we're past our hour, so we're going to wrap this up pretty relatively quickly. But so, Super, John Byrne came on to do Superman and Action Comics both, and he wrote The Adventures of Superman. So, again, he was drawing yeah, two titles a month. Um, Action Comics was, a, was now his team up book. He didn't have. Uh, DC Comics Presents, which had come before it. So Action Comics was Superman interacting with the rest of the DC universe under these new rules. Um, and it gave John Byrne a chance, you know, getting back to the art itself more than the story, a chance to touch on all these DC heroes that he had never been able to, you know, get to before being a, a pure Marvel guy. Yeah. So I'll have to go back and read. Yeah, good and stuff. Here. That's the one, Jay Hood. That's the one. That's the one. Yeah, yeah. That's the one where that Superboy is like from a pocket universe, but he wasn't. He was never. It's not the super. It's not Clark Kent Superman Superboy. It's from another reality, another whole universe. Gotcha. So I, I collected these all as they came out and. Grew weary of John Byrne during this era. I, I don't know. It, it, he wasn't as special as he had been before, in my opinion. I think he was getting a little bit more lazy with the art in that he wasn't doing as much in the background as he was before. I think he, he relied. His art became very formulaic in that comic book artists create symbols for shapes on characters, whether it be an eye, the way they shape a mouth. Um, some artists like say J. Scott Campbell, Jim Lee, I think they, they fall into this as well, where, you know, yeah. if they draw a woman, all the women are going to look the same. The only difference is going to be what color their hair is, what what uniform they have. And that, I think John Byrne helped play to that to a certain extent. And that's kind of what really kind of diminished um, him as a, a, a an artist more, more so than a writer back in, in this period. Yeah, he's, um, he stretched himself a little too thin there. I mean, that's that's a heavy load when you think about it. When you're talking about you're, you're, you're doing everything for their flagship character. You can say Batman as well, but Batman was distributed amongst many different more uh, writers, but he, he had a hand in all, in all those titles and writing and art and covers. Remember that. He had a, did a lot of covers. Yeah, that's a heavy load. So, yeah, some of it is a little bit more pedestrian. But let me tell you, pedestrian John Byrne is still better than 80% of any artist sure. out there. Like I said, I, I bought it all and got rid of it all, and now I'm buying it out of 50 cent and dollar bins. That's what most of it is coming from. There's an, there's an interesting comment here, Jay Hood, you may, we may, may want to address. Have you guys talked about how Byrne was offered the art job on Crisis? I have never heard that. I've um, heard of it. Yeah, he, after immediately after his Superman run, he did the next kind of big event, of course, 
DC was like, hey, we made a lot of money on Crisis. Their next big event was Legends, which yeah. was another limelight crossover. They had tie-ins and all that kind of stuff that we're familiar with today. That didn't it didn't carry the same weight nearly as much as what Crisis no. did. No, um, it, and, it was a it solid was, story, though. I mean, when, especially when you consider you know Shazam and how it affected him. You know, sometimes we think, well, for you to be an effective villain, you have to have, you have to overpower the hero. Well, this this miniseries sort of say you don't. You have to you have to change the mindset of society about them, and it almost worked. It was this close to work. Yeah, I mean, this was the era where they were kind of relaunching the Justice League. So you got Guy Gardner there as the Green Lantern. So that was kind of back in that era. I, I looked at the dates, and Legends happened, a, I think it was after Man of Steel, but kind of concurrent with his launch of the Superman title. So it wasn't, the dates kind of all line up. So it was all happening about the same time. And like you said, yeah. Roger, I, I'm sure it was overwhelming just the amount of work and attention he was getting. And I've been watching a few interviews with him, and he admits that. He thinks taking on Superman was a mistake for him. He was not ultimately happy with the results that he got out of it, which is hard for me to imagine because of, you know, I see how much work it went into it. I mean, his run didn't last nearly as long as Fantastic Four or X-Men. Um, it's probably closer to, I'm just looking at the size of the stack, closer to his run on the album flight. Um, yeah. But again, he was writing three books. He was controlling all of Superman during that point. Yeah. So, but uh, I, I think we will cut it off there. Yeah. Good, good uh, stuff, man. Good stuff. I mean, he was, he was, he was just he, even, even though he's he himself is very critical of it. Uh, I, I enjoyed the heck out of it. I, I think his reimagining of the character was masterful. Um, and I've reread that Man of Steel series, and it still holds up for me today. And it, it was definitely needed. Um, I mean, back in the day, the purists were really poo pooing it. Um, I, myself, being a lifelong comic book fan, I was just happy to see Superman receive, you know, a big breath of fresh air, some freshness to him. Um, I, I wasn't one way or the other as far as the changes go, but it was just, it was good to see that much effort being put into the character. So. Uh, so yeah, that takes us through the, the end of the 80s. So we'll pick up kind of in the late 80s as, as part of the 90s discussion. Um, but that's going to happen on Jason's channel on From Heroes to Icons. And uh, we'll talk about that and we'll get that scheduled. Uh, the links to both these gentlemen's channel are in the comments or in the show description below. So please be sure to check them out. Uh, you'll get loads and loads of knowledge from Metarog, uh, loads of passion from Heroes Icons. Uh, we all love this era, the, this artist especially. Um, yeah. So if you like what you've seen tonight, check out these other guys. Check out the rest of my back matter, and uh, you'll find more of this kind of content. So I'll invite you guys. Metarog, do you have anything coming up you'd like to talk about on your channel? Well, tomorrow I'm actually uh, I'm going to be talking to Jerry the Jitterbug, the uh, great comic book conservationist, uh, about um, what his techniques are, and I'm going to show the Silver Street 12 that he did for me, that he turned from a rag to a royal. Uh, wow. And uh, and Thursday we got Grader's notes uh, on Comic Con 84's channel. So um, is it spoiler, spoilers to say, did he use rice paper in this restoration? He did not. Okay. I, I've always wanted to figure out, okay, what's this white rice paper stuff and why does it work for restoring calories? He did not, but he did But he did use leaf casting. Okay. I, I'm definitely going to check that out. I'm very curious now. Jason, what have you got coming up that you'd like to talk about? Um, not doing much. I'm uploading some video game gameplay. I'm trying to switch it up a little bit. Okay. And now that we've done this, I will be doing my, uh, we'll call it a retrospective, but I, gonna, I'm going to show it again just in case people missed it. I will have an on-the-run video 
but John Burns Alpha Flight. Nice. Which I'll be able to go a little slower and you know, it'll be more in depth yep. just on what he did and showing more interiors. And I'm gonna find that splash page that he did when Guardian runs up on out uh Omega Flight or whatever. Gotcha. That's pretty much it. All right. We'll definitely look forward to seeing that. Uh, again, everybody, thanks for coming and watching. Um, yeah, C. Wood was here, Mag Magic Glasgow, Dave Enrique, and know Coach Vic's out there still. Thanks for hanging out with us, guys. Uh, leave a, a like, leave a comment. Let us know what your favorite John Byrne work is and why, so I can go hunt it down. All right. And uh, remember, on the J Hood Creative Channel, I'd like to remind you keep your priorities straight, faith, family, comic books. We'll see you next time, guys.